get into the introduction of Brent, Brendan, I'd like to say that Sunday was a blessing. Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon, and also the back to school bash was tremendous. And the young men that done the service uh, Sunday night, thank you. Thank you for your uh, abilities and thank you for your serving your Father in Heaven. Uh, there were some serious uh, banging around going on in the yard in knocker ball. Uh, my wife participated. She found out she had fallen and she could not get up. So it was wonderful. And tonight we have another minister of the, of the Lord's uh, Word. We have Brendan Chance here. He has served as the associate minister for the Austinville Church of Christ in Decatur, Alabama since 2011. Prior to moving to Decatur, he spent seven years in the same role working with College Avenue Congregation in Enterprise, Alabama. He served internships at the Del Rada and Houston Park congregations. Uh, Brendan serves on the board of directors for Exposure Youth Camp, Decatur Work Group. He has worked with young people through various other camps, programs all over the South. Brendan is a producer of content for the Walking in His Footsteps Ministry resource site. A 2004 graduate of Faulkner University, he has been married to his wife Jeannie since 2005. They have been blessed with three daughters, Katie Brooke, Lane, and Abby, which is a wonderful thing. And I'd like to say, Brendan, uh, congratulations on your marriage in, since 2005. Today is my 37th year of being married to a wonderful woman that has put up with me that many years. Uh, if the students that need to be dismissed, you can be dismissed to your classes at this time. And I give to you Brendan Chance. Well, I appreciate that introduction, brother. Congratulations on your anniversary. God bless you many more. Uh, we're all lucky to have uh, these women who put up with us. And uh, man alive, but what would, where would we be without them? Who knows, huh? We'd be on a hill, uh, a big old hill of trouble, that's for sure. Hey, I want to thank you once again for uh, having me and being back with you. It's been a couple of years, I believe. And I appreciate you here at North Highlands. I appreciate the good work you do. Uh, Thomas and the young people going out doing the disaster relief. That's actually my first uh, interaction with anybody from this congregation was when you all came to Enterprise in 2007. Was anybody on that trip besides Thomas that's in here right now? Okay, yeah. And y'all came down to College Avenue and you did a lot, of, a lot of roofing, right? That's what you did, didn't it? And, uh, and if I believe if it's correct, uh, the roofing that you, you weren't roofers at that time, were you? And you, that was where you kind of learned the skill? So, hey, that was a blessing we didn't really intend on providing, but we did. How about that? And, uh, and so I've always held a, held a, uh, held a near and dear uh, spot to this congregation, even though I don't know you all very well because of that, because you all came and you made several trips. And when we were going through our grieving, our mourning, and our recovering from that tragedy, you all were able to come in and, and take up a lot of work that our youth group would have done, normally done. And so I always will be indebted and appreciative of this congregation. I appreciate Trey and Leanne. They've been a big blessing in my life. We go back a, a long ways. Uh, Leanne is picking on me now. Uh, Trey was actually my youth minister once upon a time, but she says that I look older than Trey now because of all the gray hair. Trey doesn't have three daughters. <laughs> well, you are blessed here to have them working with you here at North Highlands. He, he speaks very well to eldership here, and I'm proud of that. And uh, uh, God bless you here in your work. And it looks like you've had a really good summer series, too. I'm blessed to be uh, in the company of those men who've spoken to you. Uh, I, I, I'm blessed to be working with a good preacher, Mark Posey. Many of you probably know Mark from being in the area for so long. He's been in our congregation for 22 years, 22 years. And um, he, he told me in Austinville, if you're, if you're going to tell something that, that's funny, you need to warn the congregation. Uh, and I, I fell into that the hard way. I've, I've let many jokes go in sermons and uh, funny uh, uh, anecdotes go in sermons and they just look out and everybody's just staring at me. So this is intended to be a little joke. You may not find it funny, you may. If you do, we're welcome to laugh. There was a youth minister who had taken a 
a group out of town on a campaign, a gospel campaign, and, and they were out working, and, and he did not know this town very well. And they found, he found a little boy on a bicycle riding down the street, and he, he goes to the, to the boy, and he, and he says, uh, we need to know where Walmart is. You know, if you take a youth group anywhere, you go with kids anywhere, no matter how many, how many supply lists you send out, how many instructions you have, how many meetings you have, you've got to go to Walmart one time at least to get their stuff that they're going to forget. So the, he asked the little boy, where is Walmart? Uh, I, we need to go to Walmart. And the little boy tells him where it is. It's over there by in the main area and gives him directions. And they're all fine and dandy. And he says, hey, by the way, uh, young fella, I'm, I'm here. We're having, a, we're having a gospel meeting. We're having a campaign. Love for you to come bring your mom and dad and come to church with us tonight. Come be a part of our gospel campaign. I want to tell you how to get to heaven. And the little boy looks at him and says, you're going to tell me how to get to heaven? You can't even get to Walmart. <laughs> See, the warning works. Mark knows what he's talking about. All right. And so even though we may not always succeed when we do our outreach, when, when we try to go into the community, when we try to help others, it, it's worth to try. It's worth entrusting God to overcome our fears and take a step out to become community-oriented. Becoming community-oriented can be a challenge. It may not be natural. It's easy for us to all be together when we go to places like Camp Maywood or, or Exposure or whatever it is you're involved or even spending time together with congregation. It feels good to be with Christians, and God bless, God bless you for that time, and I'm thankful to God for that time we have together. But that's not the intended function of the church. There's other things to do. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to the book of Acts tonight. If we're going to look at the, the functioning of the church and the pattern of the church, I don't know of a better place to go than the book of Acts. We're going to start off and we're going to kind of, I'm going to talk about a few other places, but we're going to spend most of our time in chapter 5. And you look in chapter in the book of Acts, we see what a church should look like. We see the structure of the church here and, and the functioning of the church. And when you look at the structure that Luke writes the book of Acts in, it's almost like he looks at it from this side, and then it goes down the list a little bit, and he looks at it from the other side. Uh, he, he takes a look inside and out. One's perspective is from the church looking out, and one perspective is from looking inward. And so he, in the inside, he reveals to us the continual prayer that they had, the study, the breaking of bread, and the generosity of the church. Concerning the church's relationship with those on the outside, he stresses they're, they're sharing the message of Jesus, their opposition that they face, and their persecution that they have. For instance, real quickly, Acts chapter 1. In Acts chapter 1, we see the apostles and the early believers here. Uh, they're being uh, alone with Jesus and being taught by him, being told to go and wait for the Holy Spirit to come. Then Luke records how they were, they're inward, they're praying together and how they chose someone to replace Judas. And so chapter 1 is an example of taking an inward look at the people. Now you go to chapter 2. At the beginning of chapter 2, we see the Holy Spirit falls upon them. The day of Pentecost is there. Uh, the preacher stands up, preaches the first gospel sermon. 3,000 people become followers of Christ. Outward. Within the same chapter, at the end of Acts chapter 2, starting around verse 42 or so, Luke shifts the focus back to the church. And we see the wonderful fellowship and the friendship and the unity they enjoyed. Selling and giving all and blessing one another with the lives that they lived. And then in Acts chapter 3, all the way to verse 4, about verse 22 or so, we see the church once again out in the world. Peter and John, they heal a lame man who was lame from birth, and they use that as an opportunity to preach to a huge crowd. And then they're arrested... And they're thrown in jail, and they're warned and threatened to keep their mouth shut concerning Jesus. Now, once again, as we keep going down through chapter 4, we're kind of having this back and forth here. And we'll get to why in just a second. The last one, and we go back to the church. We see them pray to God to empower them with their continued sharing of the gospel, despite the warnings not to. We see their generosity and their willingness to help those in need. And then we see a negative side, but it is still an inward look. We see Ananias and Sapphira. And all that ordeal, which we'll visit more in a minute. You see, Luke has a reason, I believe, for maybe presenting his account in this way. He's trying to fix our attention on the two aspects of church life that we always need to be looking at. The first is a gathering in the church, the inside look. And I was that he was talking about. The church has to be committed in developing and caring for its members. 
We've got to love one another. We've got to treat one another right. Because after all, how is the world going to look at us if we don't love one another? Why would anybody want to be a part of a group of people that don't care about one another? You see, the church is needing to care for one another. and He's trying to give us a pattern for that here. There has to be an effort to encourage one another while at the same time exhorting one another and challenging each other. There has to be times of worship, times of study, times of prayer, times of rejoicing, and times of crying and weeping and support. And that's how we gather together. We need each other. We have to have each other. No one can do this alone. And that's one of the main things that Luke is communicating here in the book of Acts. And that's one of the main things that we see as a command by example in the book of Acts. And that's one aspect. The other aspect of it is Luke is showing us that we are called to be going. We're called to be obeying that great commission. We're supposed to be the people taking action. He shows the churches at work should be good news of Jesus. And he shows that great numbers of people are saved. You know we have to have a healthy balance between the two, don't we? We have to have a healthy balance. I know of a preacher that was, uh, had, a, had a stretch of time where he was teaching or preaching eight times a week. Eight times a week. That's impressive. And that's great that those people, that congregation, was being fed that much spiritually. But the problem came when some wanted to know, why isn't that preacher baptizing anybody? Well, he wasn't baptizing anybody because he was teaching people who were already Christians eight times a week. See, there has to be a balance to it, don't we? We have to make sure we're taking care of one another, loving one another, doing the things that we're commanded to do, doing the things that are a blessing to each other as fellow Christians. But we also have to make sure that we're going out we're going out to the highways and the byways. We're going out into the lo world that is lost and showing them Jesus because we're not going to see it anywhere but from us. And if you've ever spent any time, I, I'm, from, I'm from Alabama. We call it a seesaw. You might call it a teeter-totter. I don't know. But if you ever spent on one and if it gets out of balance, it's no fun, right? You've got to keep that thing in balance. You've got to have, have an even flow to it. And so it is with the work and, of the church. And so that leads us down to Acts chapter 5 and our, our today. The early church is here back outside sharing Jesus. And the passage of Scripture is divided into two parts, the church of the work of the community and the, trial of the, and the church on trial. But we're only going to concentrate on the work in the community tonight. And so let's look at the first part of the text. Acts chapter 5, verses 12 through 16. We'll be coming back to this periodically, so if you have a mark, you might want to put your mark there. And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Yet none of them dared join them, but people esteemed them highly. The people esteemed them highly. And believers were increased, increasingly added to the Lord. Multitudes of both men and women. So they brought the sick onto the streets and laid them on the beds and the couches that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. And also a great multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing the sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits. And they were all healed. You can't help but notice when you look at the first century church here, and you can't help but notice and you compare it with the life that Jesus lived, that they seem very similar, don't they? They're all about the same things. We see these church members here were living and ministering just like Jesus did. They were healing like Jesus. They were loving people like Jesus. They were preaching and teaching the temple like Jesus did. Maybe that's why people called them Christians, because they were like Christ. Maybe that's why they were a church that is and was of Christ. Because they were being just like him, emulating him. The only difference is there was only one Jesus. But these people were a, lot of, were, were a Jesus look-alike group. And more and more people that work together, more and more people will be blessed living like Jesus. There's a man named Charles Sheldon, and he wrote a book called In His Steps. And in this book, he challenged a group of people that he was working with that for one solid year, one solid year that they would ask themselves the question, how would Jesus handle this situation, or how would he speak here? Or, just like we used to say, what would Jesus do? And for a solid year, this group of people did, and their lives changed. And the world around them changed. Every, every decision they made, that thought ran through their mind. You know, and then back in the, when I was a teenager, we wore some bracelets with those letters on them. And every now and then, I would still see a WWJD shirt or bracelet or... Or, or whatever. And those questions were, what would Jesus do? And you know, the difference in, and those things are good, but the difference in that first century church 
is they didn't have to wear a bracelet, did they? They had it written on their hearts. It was written on their very hearts. And it guided them in their every thought was to be like Jesus. You know, Paul describes this in 1 Corinthians 12, 27, that church is supposed to be the body of Christ. It is the body of Christ, and if we are his body, then we should behave and act like him. We're to act, work, and minister like Jesus did, like these first century Christians did. And maybe that's why some Christians are frustrated. Maybe that's why some congregations are frustrated, because they don't. Because they don't minister like Jesus. They don't reflect him. Maybe, our, maybe we need to examine ourselves on that. The Barna group did a study. Barna group did a study. And they asked people one word. Describe Jesus in one word. And the top results were wise, accepting, compassionate, gracious, humble. Many things that, you would, you, that we would say uh, that you would expect to hear. Same group asked the question, then following, describe Christians. One word, describe Christians. And some of the top answers were critical, exclusive, self-righteous, narrow, and repressive. You see, there's a difference between knowing the good news and being the good news. We're the evidence of Christ that walks the earth today. We're his people, and how our lives live are the credence to this book. We're the ones that can teach and show Jesus everything counts all the time. And it may have been a time when you could have had a, a dynamic preacher in a community who could come in and, and rattle the walls with speaking and, and people would line up. That's before my time, uh, but I hear stories about these, about these occurrences, these tent meetings I had. And, there, and maybe at once upon a time that worked. And maybe it still works and maybe we're missing something. I, maybe I am. If you know, please come tell me. But I think people are different today. I don't know why or how, but those results don't have from just having be, being preached to about things and having a dynamic speaking. People are changing, and they look for something they can relate to. They look for something that they can, that they can experience, and they don't mean that in a negative way. They want to see real. They, people can talk the game. We can say a lot of things, but... Today, people want to see action. They want to see transformation in people. They want to see tangible results, and that can be a difficult thing to communicate. People want to be transformed, and we need to change our lives, and hopefully by changing our lives to be more like Christ, we can help them change their lives. The first century church saw people transformed. Those people experienced something. Their lives were changed. It was by more than just Peter's preaching on the day of Pentecost. It was by the lives that they lived and the, the, the following of Christ. In this text, we see three things we individually need in our personal lives and in the church, if we're going to be a church that is of Christ caring for our community. We need purity from within. We need purity from within. In verse 12 and 13, let's see, you don't have a big old, we have a big old red clock at Austinville that I'm used to. Let me take my watch off and uh, put that there. There we go. I don't want to make you late for your supper tonight. In verses 12 and 13 of chapter 5 in the book, book of Acts, we looked at it already, but be mindful here about the, look at what the people had. They were doing signs and wonders, verse 12, and they were within one accord. They were one accord. They were together. They were together. People esteemed them highly. We'll talk about that more. Nothing was more damage to the cause of Christ, in my opinion, than a double agent. And someone who's trying to work both sides of the fence. And I think there's a lot of people out there who live in their lives in such a way where they have just enough Christianity and just enough Bible in their lives where they're miserable. Where they feel guilty for the sin that they commit. Where they feel guilty for not doing enough. But yet they have sin in their lives. And they also try to balance the act. We need to be a people who strive to live pure lives. And that can be difficult. We need to be a corporate group that strives to be purely God's people and follow His Word and His Word only. We looked at the sin and the judgment of Ananias and Sapphira. You remember that story? I'm sure you do, that account that has happened uh, in the book of Acts also. Their problem was they, they were trying to maybe have some recognition among the people. They saw the recognition that maybe someone else got, and they wanted to be highly esteemed maybe more than them. They lied to the Holy Spirit, and they lied to the church by saying they were given their entire sum of money. 
that they had received for selling the land. And they were holding some of it back. And the reality were they were hypocrites. And the reality was Satan was using them to establish a foothold in the Lord's church. And you remember that story, and you remember that God strikes them both dead, don't you? And I've always had a hard time with that because that seems a little harsh. That, that, that seems, a, that's not a lot of flexibility there, is it? You go, okay, you're dead. <laughs> um, why is that, though? Why did God take this sin so seriously where he was just going to strike them dead right then and there? Why? Well, because their, their hypocrisy was a threat to the church. And he wanted everyone to know that he takes sin seriously, especially one that can disrupt the Lord's church, especially one that can tarnish his son's name, especially one that can divide and destroy his chosen generation. After the sin was taken care of here, we see that they are once again in one accord. So many churches need to hear this. The people of the church, by its, of its members, will always determine its unity. Purity always strengthens the unity of the church, while impurity drives wedges between people. And make no mistake, Satan is trying to chip away at your congregation that you attend and the congregation that I worship with in the Lord's Church worldwide. He's trying to chip away at us. Just get a foothold and do damage, little by little. In the 1990s, we loved everything Titanic. The movie is still the number one grossing movie of all time. Star Wars gave it a run for its money, but it couldn't catch it. We loved everything about the Titanic. It seemed like a National Geographic was always sending some poor soul down there in a scuba suit to try to check it out, or a submarine, and there would be specials on the Discovery Channel on Fox. Uh, Celine Dion had one of the largest songs of all time. Saturday Night Live has a had a running skit for years and years and years making fun of Celine Dion singing the Titanic song. We love the Titanic. <laughs> well, in the 90s, they said, let's send a study down there. Let's determine why this thing sunk. Uh, we had to know all about the Titanic. So in 1997, an article runs about this, about why the Titanic sunk. And we may have always heard that it was a giant iceberg that hit it. Well, this study showed that while it might have been a giant iceberg that hit it, it was probably underwater, and it probably caused a series of small holes and cracks and damages in the hole. The massive 900-foot cruise ship sank in 1912. It was sailing, sailing from England to New York, and 1,500 people died on it. The large, it's still the largest maritime disaster of all time. And we all think that a giant mountain of an iceberg took it down, hitting it head on. That's what we visualize. But buried in the mud, we discovered the damage is small. A lot of little gashes, a lot of small holes, narrow slits across the back of the hull took down the giant vessel. Right below the waterline, right below the waterline, which may have appeared safe, Laid sudden and certain disaster. You know it's the same way with the Lord's church. Right below that borderline, Satan's lurking for us. And he's, and he's holding those secret sins and those things that we try to hide. And those things can destroy a church. And so we have to be committed to living holy lives, righteous and pure. We have to be God's people. And he has to be number one for us because he is holy he takes sin very seriously. And if we're going to go without, and if we're going to go into our communities, we've got to have our act together first. Now, we can fall into the, the trap here. The trap that can be said is, well, we're not ready. Well, we're not good enough. We've got to deal with this problem. Folks, there's always going to be problems in there. There's always going to be somebody who's slipping up. There's always going to be something to deal with. If we wait for that, we'll be waiting to, for Jesus to come back, and that's too late. Don't let that stop you, but at the same time, let's be thinking about how important it is for us to live pure lives and represent God's church in a pure manner to our community. And on that note, the next thing is we need to seek respect from without. Did you see that over in, in Acts, Acts, Acts chapter 5? Did you see that? I touched on it just ever so briefly. In verse 12, uh, excuse me, in verse 13, yet none of the rest dared join them, but the people esteemed them 
highly. The line had been drawn and the standards had been set. These were God's people and these were not God's people. These people were following Christ and these people were not following Christ. There's a lot of e- it, it may be easy to just, in some religious groups, to sign up a card and become a member. That's not what was going on here. That's not what was going on here at all. As a matter of fact, people see the Christians and they go, hey, I respect that, but that's not for me. That's too hard for me. That's too difficult for me. I can't accomplish that. But I still respect them. But I still hold them in high esteem. I still appreciate what they're doing. I would suggest to you, as we begin to turn our minds from being inward to outward, to being community-oriented, that we hold that important. That lesson is important. People know this. People notice us. And it's an incredible lesson I want you to understand. While people may not agree with your beliefs, they can still come to respect and admire your behavior. And if they respect and admire your behavior, then you have a chance to always communicate Christ further from them. Not everyone's going to believe that God created the world. As a matter of fact, a lot of people think we're playing out crazy for believing that. Not everyone's going to believe that. Not everyone's going to believe that this Bible is the actual Word of God. Not everyone's going to believe that Jesus came and died for our sins and rose again. And that He's the only way to God. Not everyone is going to believe that. Not everyone's going to believe that we're commanded and place our faith in Him as Lord and Savior. Not everyone's going to believe that. But they will take the love that we offer them. And they will accept our acceptance of them. And when they need that thing that they can't meet, when they have that problem they just can't handle, they'll take our help then. And they'll greatly appreciate our generosity. Nobody's going to wish you a bad ad- had a bad attitude towards them. And nobody's going to wish that you would give them a cold shoulder. But if you have the right attitude, and if we're living our lives the right way, people will notice. And we can make a difference th- through that way, reaching out to our community. People respect our lifestyle and integrity, even though they may not agree with it or accept our beliefs. We have to remember that because sometimes it's easy to write people off. Somebody who says, well, I don't believe that old Jewish book of fables. It's easy to ball that person up and throw them in the trash and never come back to them. But they're watching you. They're watching you and they're watching me. And we can show Jesus to them one little step at a time. You know, over and over and over. I hear stories like that. You usually hear them at funerals when here comes somebody down the aisle to pay respects to the family that you never thought would show up. Well, he always did this, and he was at work, and he never never used the foul language or didn't laugh at the dirty jokes or wouldn't come to the drinking parties. People noticed those things. That's why it's important for us to live those consistent lives. Book of Colossians, chapter chapter 4. Verses 5 and 6. Walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. The salt lesson is interesting to me. Jesus gives us the, you are the salt of the earth in Matthew chapter chapter 5, verse 13. Many people interpret that different ways of what Jesus was trying to communicate there about salt, because salt is capable of doing Many different things. Uh, Salt is a preservative. Before we had refrigerators and freezers, um, we would salt the meat, dry it out, smoke it, and it would be good for a longer period of time. Salt is a preservative. They had a way from from going bad. Christians have a responsibility too. As our culture falls around, falls apart around us, and changes become faster and faster, we need to be the salt in trying to preserve what's good about our culture and save what's good about our culture. So also flavors. Christians were to add flavor and excitement, uh, excitement to the world full of hurt, pain, and suffering. We're to be the people that show what true love is, not try to win the argument or the debate, or, or, or just come out on top. We're to salt and flavor the earth. Salt also stimulates thirst. I always make the mistake at the movie theater putting too much salt in my popcorn. And I get very thirsty, and it's a problem. It makes you thirsty. It dries you out. It stimulates thirst. And a Christian should live our lives in the way to those around them are curious about what we have that they don't. They thirst to know more. 
And Jesus could have meant any of those things or several other lessons you can teach with salt. But I know one thing for sure. Salt cannot preserve. Salt cannot flavor. And salt cannot cause thirst without contact. Without contact. That shaker sitting on the table is not going to do any work by itself. Not one bit of flavor is going to be added to that meat by it staying inside. And so we as Christians, we have to get out of our, the comfort of our shakers. We have to get out and make contact with people. There's no magic bullet. There's, uh, when, when, when I teach the evangelism series to our young people, they want to know, uh, how can we talk to our friends about Jesus? Or, or what do I say? There's no magic bullet. I'm sorry, young and old. You've got to do it. You just got to do it. You just got to get out and talk to people and love them and show them. You got to be the salt, but the salt has to have contact to make a bit of difference. All we have to do is live the life that God has called us to live. All we have to do is live the life that God has called us to live. Share Jesus. But he does go on to say that if salt loses its saltiness, it's good for nothing, and that's true. You're no good to the Christians. Christian, if you don't bring anything to the table, if you don't bring flavor to the group, the flavor to the conversation, flavor to the congregation, saving power to the congregation, it doesn't do any good for the other Christians if you lost your saltiness. And you're no good to the non-Christian because we don't give them any reason to want to be a Christian. Let's be the salt of the earth. You know, many times, over and over again, we hear people criticize the church. I don't want to be with those people. They're mean. I've heard that. I hear about the fighting they have with one another and what she said about her or what he's done to him. I don't want to be associated with a group of people like that. God forbid anybody says that about the Lord's church. I mean, we, we mess up, we fall short, but let's do what we can be the salt of the earth amongst one another and without. If we're ever going to be community oriented, community oriented, we have to have a reputation that people want to be a part of. These folks also had a power that is from above. Uh, people were being saved and transformed and having their lives changed in incredible ways and with incredible numbers. In Acts 2, we, we read 3,000. We talked about 3,000 were saved. In Acts 3, we're told that number had grown to 5,000 men, not counting women, possibly up to 10,000 at that time. Very quickly here. That's impressive when you consider that. It's very impressive, and the only explanation for it it's not Peter was talented. It's not the apostles were, one, were once in a lifetime type guys who walked the earth. The only explanation for it is the power of God. It's the only explanation for it. That God, through his Holy Spirit, can accomplish things that you and I can never imagine. Luke also shows that there was healing going on here. People were experiencing the supernatural healing that God provided through the apostles at this time. People say, well, why don't we have healing in the churches now? It would change so much. People would see. Well, I would, I would suggest to you to, to strengthen your faith because people saw Jesus healing folks all the time and they rejected him. We have the complete word of God, 1 Corinthians 13. And with it, we can be empowered to do anything. These people today, they may get wrapped up in miracles and they miss knowing that God is the source of the miracles. They, they miss understanding that God is what provides the power. And we want to be like the people we see in the first century here in the sense not that we are healing one another, but they turn to God to ask Him for the power. We can turn to God today to ask Him to empower us. Empower us through the Holy Spirit, through the Word. In our prayers and in our study, in our time together, God will empower us if we'll let Him. Luke chapter 11 Verses 9, 13. Sorry, I lost my mark there. Here it is. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and who you seeks finds. And to him who knocks it will be open. If a son asks for bread, and any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your fa heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Ask God to help you reach out to your community. 
Ask God to help you reach out to that coworker, that teammate, that's the guy next to you in, in chair and band, or wherever it is you're, you're in contact with people. You've got to make contact make a difference. You've got to be out and about to make a difference. And then you've got to speak up to let them know. They can see your example, but they also need to be taught. God will empower you to do that if you do ask Him. Now, I'll only warn you, Christians, ask God to open doors for you. Be ready to step through them because He will do that. Have courage. You can do it through God who strengthens you. Now, I want to talk to you about something else here. We have to do, we're empowered, so let's do something. We have to be about God's people here. Like Paul was. Acts chapter 17. In Acts, Acts chapter 17, Paul's entered into a pagan, pagan culture here. He's, entered, he's outnumbered. He's, he's on his own. Uh, he, he, he is severely outnumbered, maybe more so than any of us can ever imagine. And in verse 16, it says, Now Paul waited for them at Athens. The Spirit provoked him within when he saw the city was given over to idols. Therefore he reasoned with the synagogue, with the Jews, and with the Gentile worshipers, and in the marketplace daily, and to those who happened to be there. See, he could have sat there. He could have sat there and prayed. He could have sat there and, and done some writing. He could have sat there and had his own personal time. But he goes out. He notices this world, Athens, is lost. And he goes out to them anyway. He goes out to them anyway and probably gets into some uncomfortable situations. Conversations that weren't easy to have. And then we know, if you know your story here, if you know the account here, that he ends up walking to the Areopagus with the idols lining the road. And then the great, great account there when he sees the idol to the unknown God and he gets to share the gospel with them. But he never gets that opportunity to talk to the unknown God without getting out and being amongst the people. Without getting out and being uncomfortable, possibly. Without doing things that were difficult to them. You know, something interesting in Scripture that I've noticed. God chooses mountaintops to talk to His people a lot. He chooses physical mountaintops. Uh, Moses, Mount Sinai, right? Exodus 20, Ten Commandments, God speaks to him. How about, how about the burning bush that was in a mountainous area? Exodus chapter 3. Abraham and Isaac on Mount Moriah, Genesis 22, and the, 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 config, the transfiguration of Christ in the book of Matthew, chapter 17. You see, he, he causes people to these mountaintops. He causes people to these mountaintops when, he, when he, he shares something with them in all these accounts. God shares with them. And they had this experience, this mountaintop experience, where they're contacting God, where they're communing with God. And it's wonderful. And we as Christians, we have mountaintop experiences, hopefully on, on Sunday mornings. And when we're together doing great things on retreats and mission trips, we have these mountaintop experiences. Well, but does anybody live on a mountaintop? Not for very long, do they? People don't live on mountaintops, do they? I mean, there might be some, a few people along the way, but on the pinnacle of mountains, you don't see villages. You don't see great cities on top of a peak of a mountain, do you? It's not inhabitable. There's no people there. But God called his people to talk to them there. But he always sent them back down, didn't he? He always sent them back down to the valleys. People live in the valleys. We live in a valley. People live in valleys. We can't stay on the mountaintops. We can't stay together at the church all the time. We have to go to the people. We have to go to the valleys. I'm sure Moses and and all those who had face-to-face -face action with God here would have rather just stayed with God, would have rather just gone up to heaven with Him. But we have a life to live, and we have a mission to accomplish, and we have to go into the valleys to the people. We can't stay within these walls and win a soul. Hopefully most of you are Christians already, but the lost people are out there. They're out there. And I don't mean this ugly, but your church sign is not going to win one soul. It helps them know where you are. That's great. But we've got to be the vessels of God's gospel. We've got to be the one that goes out into our communities, off of the mountaintop and into the valleys. Even Jesus did community outreach. 
He fed the 5,000, right? Matthew 14. Even Jesus did community outreach before teaching. You and I need to follow that same example here. I think this is a neat picture. I'm not quite sure what's going on here. Uh, it's obviously not set to be a reenactment of Jesus' times completely because you've got, like, like sitting in folding chairs they bought at Walmart. <laughs> um, and so it's a, Jesus here ministering in a, in, to the modern culture that we live in. That's what we got to do, folks. That's what we got to do. We got to take this 2,000 year old gospel that's just as powerful and special and precious as it ever was to this world. We've got to get out to do it. Let me give you some practical ideas, some things, some ways, some ways to, uh, to help. I don't have all the answers, but I like to try to give you something. Maybe y'all can go and talk about it. Maybe it spurs an idea for you. Uh, if, you if you've got, you need to be visible amongst your community. Uh, you do a great work, and I've already bragged on you about your disaster relief. Hey, if anything, God forbid, ever happens in, in this county or in this city, take the lead on that. Be God's people. Be God's people and lead helping, helping those who are hurting. And I know you're prepared to do that. That's why I said that. I know you're ready. Take the lead on that. Let them know that the Christians here at North Highlands care about them. We'll help anybody who needs help. You know, if you, if you had a way to make, be visible, if you've got a, a festival, every, every town in Alabama's got some kind of festival. Moulton's got the watermelon festival, right? Is that right? Uh, they got, I think I saw a time. No, y'all watermelon? They're chicken festival or something, right? Strawberry? Strawberry chicken, you know. Um, be visible at that. Have a booth. Sponsor something. Let people know, hey, we're part of this community, and we want to be about you, and we care about you. You can do that through there. Hey, I, everybody in the state of Alabama knows about your sports programs here. Your baseball team, your football team, uh, definitely are preeminent in this community. Sponsor, have, hang a sign on the scoreboard. Get a page in the program. Um, if they let you, some, some places it's hard to do, uh, lead the pregame prayer. Be visible. Be out and about in your community. One thing big help, and I'll speak personally here, is uh, in North Alabama, it's not quite so bad, but man, the Baptists beat us to the punch on getting, getting our preachers plugged in to different organizations. If you've got a way to get, to get Trey, and maybe he might come back and get me here, Trey plugged in to your club, your Kiwanis club, your Civitan, or your place of work, they have a devotional, or your school has an FCA, uh, or whatever it is, I'm sure he'd be glad to take advantage to be plugged into that. Or maybe it's not Trey, maybe it's Thomas, or maybe it's one of the elders. Get them plugged into that. Let them see your leadership functioning. Let them be a face with the name. Help the preacher get plugged in. Brag about what you got going on. Brag about it. It's okay. It's for the glory of Christ. You can boast in that. Paul says it's okay. You got something going on? Tell everybody about it. You had a great day last Sunday? Get on Facebook and tell the whole world about it. Get on Twitter and tell the whole world about it. Young people, take pictures of it. Put it on your Instagram. Tell the whole world about it. You can spread the gospel and you can spread what your congregation is doing now for free and you can literally spread it to anybody in the civilized world. Embrace it. Get your name out in your community through your online communities. Uh, maybe you need to, uh, an idea is purchase commercial time on a radio or a TV station. That's all you'll have your show. That's great. That's fantastic. Uh, we just uh, had a blood drive at Austinville. We had a lot of people come in from, from the community. So we got them to come into our building. And we got to meet people we wouldn't have met otherwise. And also our community, the people drive by and see. Blood drive. Oh, they care about people there. They're concerned about their health. They want to help people. We're going to be a polling center. If you can do that, that gets people from all around the area coming in and voting in your building. Get your, get your name out there. Get your recognition. Um, I don't have all the answers, and we in Austinville, we need to improve, just like I'm sure there's areas that you at North Highlands can improve, too. You know, fifth quarters, drive your bus around. That's an easy one. I had somebody actually tell me that one time. I was like, yeah, it's easy. It's a rolling billboard. Get out and drive your bus around. People see you. It looks like you're doing something. Load it up. Take it party somewhere. <laughs> Be visible. Be visible. Get your name out. Be God's people, but also use practical blessings that God has put in front of you to get Jesus' name and his people in front of this community. Anything helps. Seek opportunities to serve. Not all of them are easy. Not all of them is, is simple. It's just driving the bus around. 
Sometimes we've got to seek. Sometimes we've got to pester. Hey, F FCA president or SGA president, I really want my preacher, Trey Durden, to come and do the devotional. I really want him to do it. Well, we've always got my youth minister who comes. No, but he needs a turn too. Be persistent. Seek opportunities to glorify Christ and to get the name of North Highlands out. Be community-oriented. Never have anybody say that this church doesn't come here. Now, I don't know if they would say that. Ne but never give them an opportunity to say that this church doesn't care about the community. That's our job. That's our job. You know, there's a lot of excuses we can come up with. It's, and there's a lot of reasons we can come up with. Well, maybe we're not in the right neighborhood. Or maybe we don't have enough money for that project. Or, or maybe nobody just cares anymore. It feels like that sometimes. But that's the devil talking. That's the devil talking. He wants you to be afraid. He wants you to be afraid of failure. And God's not called us to a spirit of fear, but a spirit of love and power. Because he has empowered us through his Holy Spirit, through the Word. He has empowered us. And we can do all things through him who strengthened us because he has empowered us. So dream big. I understand the necessity to be good stewards and be practical, but dream big. Take on challenges to reach your community. Break barriers that haven't been broken before. Do something nobody else has done before. And this community will know you for it, and they'll come to know the Lord in your love for them and for Him through your efforts. Trust in Christ. Trust in Jesus to empower you more than what you fear of failure that Satan's put in you. Many times people, they fear that they're not good enough for salvation. Hey, join the club because the line's pretty long. Nobody's good enough for salvation. But if we're going to ever go outwards, we've got to look inwards first, just like in the book of Acts. Tonight, I'm looking inwards to you if you're not a Christian. If you're not a Christian, we want to reach out to you now. We want to reach out to you, and if you believe in God, I would encourage you to act on your belief. If you believe that He sent Jesus to die for your sins and He rose again, that's wonderful. That's fantastic. Act on that. The next logical thing would be to confess that you believe that, that Jesus is the Son of God. And then it makes sense that if you believe Jesus is the Son of God and you, and you believe the Word is from God and inspired, then you would want to follow the commandments that call you to repent of the sins in your life. I mean, if you're repentant of those sins in your life, and they're no, longer, they're no longer define who you are, and they're no longer hanging on you, and they're no longer what you do, and then wash away the residue, and wash away the ugly marks of those sins by being baptized and contacting the blood of Christ. Then rise again to live faithfully, showing the world the light, being the salt to somebody, living a faithful life. Hey, and maybe, maybe that's us tonight. Maybe we haven't done a very good job of reaching out. Maybe we haven't really cared about too many people other than ourselves. We fall into that trap from time to time. Very easy. Very easy to do that. I would encourage you tonight, if you need to repent of that, maybe you can handle that right where you are. Maybe you need to come forward. Or you're struggling with something else that we didn't discuss tonight. We want to love you. We want to help you. And we invite you to come forward as we stand and sing this song. What a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still. And with all who will trust and obey, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey.